Have you ever, has there ever been a, a kind of a, a situation in your life where you feel like you got took? I know that's not correct grammar, but you got hoodwinked, the bait and switch moved happened, gotcha happens. You know, uh, it, it may have been when you were trying to buy something from somebody and it ended up being a lemon. It's like, oop, gotcha. Or I tell you where it happens probably more frequently is when you're scrolling through your Facebook feed and you run across what is affectionately known as clickbait. It's that, it's that graphic with that headline that's like, imagine, and it's, I wonder what this is. And you're just drawn in and you click it and then it's another click and then you're sucked into the wormhole, so to speak, of this clickbait. Uh, sucker is kind of what you feel like after the fact. Let me give you some examples. I'm gonna save you some time. I'll throw some images on the screen. The bottom will be the headline. The top will be the sucker statement, okay? So here's the first one. This click basis, this guy tried to refrigerate his drink with an air condition, and this is what happened. Look, it got colder. That's what happened. I can save you the click. I can save you the wormhole. It just co cooled down a little bit. Uh, what's this one? Um, an elephant that spent 11 hours digging a hole finally pulls out something nobody expected. It was just its calf is what it pulled out of the hole. It's why chase the wormhole? What's the, what's the use? The next one. Um, and so you're looking at these, and some of you say, well, I clicked that one time. Okay? What is the someone is typing bubbles in the messages app actually mean? It actually means that someone is typing a message. Like, that's what it means. Save yourself the worry. Don't even, if you see these, don't click on them. It's, it's, it's clickbait. It's drawing you into something. I think we may have one more. Um, this is the single easiest way to be happier at work. Well, get outside and get some fresh air occasionally. That just works wonders. Saves you nine clicks. Don't have to worry about it. Don't waste your time. Now, why do I even say that? Uh, here's, here's the story that sets up what we're going to look at in Scripture today. So often, we're kind of fall into the trap of what we've seen, and we're lured into something, and we find ourselves navigating some clicks or in part of a conversation or swept up into a crisis that we had no business even being a part of. Okay, uh, And when we walk through this passage today, there is a story that we're going to see unfolding before our eyes and some principles that we can learn from it. I promise you, if you'll listen and lean into what God says from His Word today, it will help you in your marriage, it will help you in your parenting, it will help you in your job, whether you are the boss or the employee, it will help you in your relationships on your team, it will help you be a better follower of Jesus. Make sense? You excited? You just can't wait, can you? I didn't think so. Okay. So we're looking in Acts chapter 21. We're going to begin reading in verse 27. And if you haven't been with us, we're just kind of going verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the book of Acts. So we'll try to draw back onto some things that we've learned in the past. But if you are taking notes, which I strongly encourage you to do so in your worship guide, there's some blanks to fill in, some extra white space for you to kind of write down your own thoughts as they come along, or you can do that in the mobile app as well. So here's the first thing if you're taking notes today. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Remember that song when you were a kid? Be careful. Oh, I'm not going to sing it. Okay. Let's, let's read verses 27 through 29. When the seven days were almost completed... The Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Jews into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Question, have you ever seen something, you made an observation, and it just made your blood boil? I mean, as soon as you saw it, you could feel the blood pressure rise. Maybe it was a news, breaking news feed that, that scrolled as an alert or through your social media feed. Maybe it's you sitting on the bleachers watching your child or grandchild play soccer or baseball or whatever, and it's the scuttlebutt in the bleachers that you hear somebody else talking about something that somebody else does, and you don't even know who that person is, but you hear about it and you start to get mad. And now, now you're engaging in this conflict, and you don't even know the people. Any, Okay, none of you have ever done that, but I've heard that that happens from time to time, right? 
We just allow ourselves to hear something and we react to what we see or hear. And that's what's happening in this text today. Now, let me kind of paint the picture to describe what's going on. Uh, Last week, we looked in the verses previously in chapter 21, and we see that Paul had come to Jerusalem after this multi-year excursion. He had been working in the churches in the area known as Asia at that time. He had come back to James and to the elders. He had given a report. He had even given an offering. Their response was one of grace and of greeting, and they glorified and worshiped God. And then they kind of gave this warning to say, hey, there's some people around Jerusalem who aren't really happy with what they're hearing and saying about you. So you might want to go through a purification process to go through the temple just so you can let them see that you're acknowledging the culture that you're in. And so Paul says, sure. And we even looked last week at this principle of his ministry where he said, to a Jew, I became a Jew. And to a Gentile, I became a Gentile. Why? So that I could win them for the gospel. So Paul has been walking through this purification process. It's seven days. They're almost over where he's been going through this journey. The purification process was going through. And he's spotted by whom? He's spotted by some Jews from Asia, specifically in Ephesus. Now, this would be fun if you want to go back and listen to the sermon on Acts 19 or flip back on your own. Here's what you'll learn. When Paul got to Ephesus, we read this in the first nine verses of Acts 19. When he got to Ephesus, he begins to minister and build relationships with the people. He spent three months teaching in the synagogue. But there were certain Jews there in the synagogue who refused to believe and began to spread vicious rumors about him, so much to the point he wasn't able to teach in the synagogue anymore. He had to go rent out a community hall and begin to disciple people there for the next three years. Why is that important? We see that these same folks had followed him all the way to Jerusalem. It may very well be that this was the time of Pentecost and they were coming on this pilgrimage journey there to celebrate Pentecost. But I think the text doesn't say this specifically, but I think it's very safe to assume that Paul knew these guys by face, by name, and certainly by reputation because they had been wreaking havoc trying to undercut his ministry and his reputation by stirring up rumors for years now. And here they are again. And it is not uncommon, a little kind of cultural history, um, for those Jews who had fled Jerusalem out of exile and had established Uh, their kind of homeland and other parts of the world, it was not uncommon for them to be very strict in their adherence to Jewish customs. You got to think about it. They were taken away from the sights, sounds, and smells of their homeland. And the only way they could kind of recreate that was the strict adherence to the rules. And it kind of gave them, I'm sure, some sense of security. And but by default, they're quick to react to anything that may be a threat to that. I'm not trying to defend these Asian Jews, just maybe trying to understand a little bit more about their perspective. And so we're jumping into this story after Paul is doing his best to make peace with people. He's doing his best to follow tradition and go through the system. But here the, you could kind of read into the tone of these Jews from Ephesus that's like, We have finally trapped the monster. We've got him in our teeth. He can't get out of here now. Because the accusations that they brought against him in verse 28 of chapter 21 are synonymous with the accusations brought against Stephen in Acts chapter 6 that resulted in his death. When you accuse someone in this custom of violating the unity of people and defiling the holy place of the temple, you would be killed for that. The word defiled that you see there in verse 29 literally could be translated to make it common. It's as if they're, they're accusing him of taking this, this culture, this place that is set apart as holy, and just making it commonplace. But notice the extreme of their story. You see in verse 27. They don't just make an accusation about what they perceived to have happened in that moment. They make this huge quantum leap that says, everybody, everywhere, Paul's doing this too. And that's just not true. But I'm sure that you have also heard people making accusations that make these huge hyperbolic accusations, these quantum leaps. I think that was a real word I just said. Not sure where it came from. Moving on. 
They, they claimed that he had been teaching against people, against the law, and in this place. And notice in verse 29 the language that they said. They had previously seen him with Trophimus the Ephesian in the city, so they supposed that he also went with him into the temple. Like they didn't even observe this thing. They kind of made this huge assumption that they fabricated. They kind of connected some dots in their own mind. And they reacted. Here's, here's the warning flag, the first warning flag I'll throw up. If we're in soccer, this is the yellow card. It's not going to get us kicked out yet, but this is just the warning, okay? So many times we're quick to react rather than respond. And there's a big difference. Reaction generally happens immediately by only what we've seen or heard. Responding will tap the brakes, slow down, gather more intel so that I can make sure I'm responding accurately. This is a reminder of us of spiritual warfare. See, the enemy loves to lure us into this clickbait. As soon as we see something that someone else does, we react and we attack them. He loves to see that. And all of a sudden, we're pointing fingers. We're, we're, we're criticizing one another. And, and this may, I'm not intending to step on toes here, okay? If it does, if the shoe fits, you wear it. I'm just trying to help you, if I may. But maybe, maybe this looks like this in your home, between, between your, the spouse, your husband and your wife. And you know, maybe, maybe you're so busy, you haven't had a chance to really sit and digest and talk things, and you're just observing what they're doing or not doing, and you're jumping to a conclusion, and all of a sudden it's friction, and you're pointing the finger, and you don't love me anymore, or if you cared about me, you would do this. Nobody's ever done that, right? We, we see something, we hear something, we just react to it, and all of a sudden, these people that we love, we treat them as if they're the enemy. Well, here's, here's a statement worth writing down. I have an enemy, and it's not you. I've got an enemy, and it's not my wife. I've got an enemy. It's not my children. It's not my teammates. It's not my neighbors. It's not my life group members. It's not my church family. It, I have an enemy, and his name is Satan. And he is roaming to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. We have a common enemy. We need to beware, be guarded of our tendency to react, to jump to conclusions where we quickly might consider each other the enemy, and that's not the way God intended us to be. Let's look at the story and see what happens next, because it just gets worse. Here's the second point if you're writing things down. Be on guard when the mob begins to scream. Let's read verses 30 and 31 and see what happens in our story. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple. And at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. Now let me help us understand something. I'm amazed at when I read encounters in the New Testament how fast the news tends to spread. I mean, this escalated quickly. It went from a couple of guys making the accusations, screaming really loud, to a mob uproar, 0 to 60 in 2.6 seconds. Rapid. And this was before tel telephones, social media, and electronic communication. How did this happen? I think probably in this situation, if we really want to know, there were so many people that were gathered together in a heavy concentration of people around the time of Pentecost that, of course, it was a head more heavily populated close quarter so the news could have spread more quickly. But what did they do? They dragged him out of the temple and shut the doors. Let me explain to you what's happening because this will make even more sense in a minute. Uh, if, if you want to kind of study later the, the layout of the temple at that day, we're not going to take the time. I don't have graphics to show you. It's just important for us to understand what's happening here, for us to recognize that the open area of the temple was kind of divided off into sections. There were some places that only the priests could go. There were some places that only the Jews could go. And there was this, uh, this wall that was kind of the wall of Gentiles. There was an outer court where uh, a Gentile could be in the walls of the building, but couldn't be 
inside the place of worship. And so they were kind of allowed to be in, but they had to keep a distance. And we could talk more about why that was, but that helps us understand here in what happened in this moment. Paul was in the place of worship. They pulled him outside and shut the door. And it, and it makes a sound as though they put him in contained into this court of the Gentiles area. And I hope I'll kind of suggest further proof for that in just a minute. Because the, the Levites, the guys who kind of oversaw the temple, almost as if they had their, uh, their own police force of the day. But here's, what I, here's why I tell you all that story. Why does that even matter? Who cares? Well, here's what we need to understand. The Ephesus Jews come, they stir up scuttlebutt, a mob ensues. And what we need to recognize for this moment is the riot in the people of God did nothing to expand the kingdom of God. Let me say that one more time. The mob mentality and the riot within the people of God did nothing to expand the kingdom of God. In fact, if anything... It just makes it worse. Here's what we need to understand. I wonder how the world views Jesus' church when we slander one another, when we condemn one another, and we fall into the mob conversation. When the world sees the church, not just Calvary, I'm talking about broadly. When the world sees the church fighting rather than living in peace together, does that do anything to expand the kingdom of God? And my, how news can travel fast. See, now we have electronic communication. And just heads up, if, if a conversation ever begins with these words, be forewarned. Did you hear? If it starts that way, just throw the antenna up, throw the filter up high. It may be that what's coming up next could be a little slanderous. Uh, okay, case in point. Um, I don't know anybody here online criticism about Chick-fil-A lately. Maybe online criticism about Kanye West lately. You see how quick we just jump to stuff? And we, we use anything as an excuse to fight, argue, bicker in a public forum. Or the world can see and like, why? why do I want to have any part of that? We just need to be aware. It's, it's dangerous. And here's what I want us to understand. God warns us against slander. Uh, let me read a couple of verses. 1 Peter 2 verse 1 says this. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. Put away. Separate yourself from it. Uh, God warns us against gossip. Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. I don't know how your mom and daddy brought you up, but I remember hearing my mom would say a lot growing up. If you can't say anything nice, don't say... Oh, you heard that too. Okay, I was just, just checking. Wow. And, and, and time out, let me help you, okay? Uh, in case some of you are like, he has heard something this week. What's he ranting about? Y'all, I write these sermons four or five weeks ahead of time, okay? So what I'm giving you today is what the Lord gave me over a month ago. It has nothing to do with anything. You may, he, so you're looking at your, your wife say, did you tell him about whatever? I have no idea, okay? <laughs> nothing. We're just, we're just letting the text speak for itself, and you just see where it lands, Okay? So, here we go. But here's what I need us to understand. Gossip is a cancer to unity. When we begin to, to slander one another and spread gossip and rumors about one another, when we begin to believe those and, and step into that and react to those, it starts to erode and eat and infect and destroy unity. It's a cancer that we need to be aware of. So what do we do? Wow, this, I'm feeling good today, aren't you? This is warm and fuzzy. Well, let's, it gets better, I promise, okay? Let's, let's read on. The, here's, here's the third point I want you to write down today. Be ready to step in and act. 
be ready because we need to be engaged. So be ready to step in and act. And we're going to see how God uses a, a character in this story. And I think there are some principles that we can learn from, from this person. And he happens to be a Roman pagan. Let's see what we can learn in verses 32 through 36. He at once, talking about the tribune, he at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. That's going to be important in a minute. And he inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, away with him. Now there's, there's a lot we can learn about this tribune. The tribune we will learn later. We'll see. He's going to keep coming up for several chapters through our journey. We learn in Acts chapter 23, he has a name. It's Claudius Lysias. But let's understand a little bit about who this character is and why he's in the scene. You got to remember that Rome is kind of has ruling authority over Jerusalem at this time. And so the tribune was basically the second in charge. He was, when the officials were gone away to Rome or conducting, conducting business, his main objective was to do th two things. Protect and keep the peace. It was his job. And he had about a thousand soldiers under his care. Protect, keep the peace. And he's quick to respond, and clearly he takes his job very easily. I think it's important, this is why I kind of laid out the architecture of the temple a minute ago, because uh, it, the former uh, palace of Herod was right attached to the temple, and this was now the place where the Roman officials kind of oversaw things. And there was a staircase that came out of that directly into the court of the Gentiles in the temple. So that explains to us how they were able to get there quickly. I think it's also interesting that they strategically chose that location because they probably knew all these faith-minded people would be the ones fighting all the time where they may need to quickly respond. So here they run down the steps. They're quickly engaged. And I want us to notice, I told you to kind of put a pin in the fact in uh, verse 34 that he is bound with two chains because that is a prophecy that is fulfilled that was said all the way back in chapter 21 verse 11. If you remember when he was making his way to Jerusalem, Agabus came and prophesied over him and said, both arms will be bound. And so this is a fulfillment of that, that that prophecy came true and we see it here. Just something for us to see this woven thread of the Holy Spirit moving and speaking and preparing in this big story. This confusion breaks out and here's Here's where I want to draw our attention and kind of land the plane today. We can learn a lot from this Roman tribune. He took his job seriously to protect the people and to keep the peace. And it is a reminder for us in situations that life inevitably brings our way that we are called to react and respond differently. In fact, I would go so far as to say we need to be aware and sensitive to how we engage or debate and the words that we use. I'm not saying we shouldn't be engaged. I'm saying we should be distinctively Christian in our engagement. This, this fleshes it out in tons of ways. Sometimes it's really simple. Sometimes it is the attitude and how I react when I'm in the line at Walmart and I see the 30 lines that are not opening, and I'm in the one that's only open, and the line's back to the milk line, and how do I act in that moment? Like, what, what testimony am I giving? What is, how do I react and respond with grace and peace when I'm visiting the DMV? Like, how in those moments am I Christian? Because we're called to act and respond differently. What does Jesus say in John 13? This will, all men will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have for one another. So we need to recognize that how we react and how we respond to situations, it matters. It makes a difference. And so I would just encourage you to get in the habit of asking this question. It's a filtering question, really. 
When you're in a situation, or maybe even before you get into the situation, begin to filter and ask, okay, how should I be distinctively Christian in this thing? How can I exhibit the love and character of God and the fruit of the Spirit in this situation? It's really helpful because we are called to live differently. In fact, let me point you to three things. This is not an exhaustive list. Three things in the way in which we're called to live. The first one, we are called to keep peace. We see this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. We are called to unity. We see this in Romans 12, 16, and 18. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. You know the Greek interpretation of all? It means all people. The third thing, we're called to listen to the Holy Spirit and not the winds of change. Galatians 5, 25 through 26 says this, If we live by the Spirit, let's, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. This, this mindset and, and the language here of keeping in step with the Spirit it, it is the literal example of a drill sergeant calling cadence and this rhythm of step moving in unison. And the beauty of that imagery that many of us get and understand is that when one person falls in cadence and everybody falls in cadence, the beauty of God's people moving in rhythm together when we're listening to the same voice. It draws in unity. It draws in fellowship, but it causes us to resist the temptation to get swept into whatever may be the upcoming trend, whatever is the radical new idea. It may be a new trend, and it may be an idea worth considering, but we need to pause, tap the brakes, Holy Spirit, is this what we should do in our life, in our homes, in our marriage, in our church? Because we need to follow the leadership and the cadence of God in our lives not culture. Okay, let, let's get real practical if we can. Uh, I'm going to commend a book to you. This is not a church book. This is, this is just a leadership book, okay? But I would encourage you to read it. Uh, Crucial Conversations, Tools for Talking When the Stakes Are High. Great book. There's some principles in this book that will help you in your marriage. Uh, if you, in your job, you are a, a, an owner or a boss, this will help you lead your team better. If you are uh, middle management or, you know, just a, a worker bee, this will help you be a better teammate. Um, if, if you are in the church, which you are, it'll help you be a better church member, okay? And let me, let me kind of show you an illustration to maybe unpack all of these things we've seen today, and we'll point back to how this fleshed out in Acts chapter 21. I'm going to show a graphic. Okay, exercise some self-control. Don't look at all of it yet. I want you to pay attention to the gray arrow on the far left where it says, see and hear, under the title me. Because that's me, and you put yourself there. Watch what happens. This is, this is beautifully illustrated in the book. This is not, I'm not smart enough to communicate this way. Okay, But here's what happens. I see something or I hear something. And based upon what I have seen and I've heard, I fill in the blanks and I tell myself a story. There's no way it's all the information, but based upon the sliver that I have, I tell myself a story. And then based upon that story, an emotion begins to swell in me. It could be a positive or negative. And then based upon what I feel, I act. Let's, let's put some situations in our life in this grid to flesh it out, okay? Uh, Let's start on the negative. Let's say you're at work, you're at your desk, you've gotten there early, you've even made the coffee for everybody. Like, I'm going to really serve people well today. So you're at work, doing your thing at your desk, and your boss walks by, 
doesn't even make eye contact with you, goes in their office and slams the door shut. Okay? You've seen something and you've heard something. No, no words were spoken. You've just observed something and you tell yourself a story. Because most everybody is naturally insecure, we may start to have thoughts going through our mind. They saw how much I was on Facebook at work yesterday, and I'm about to get fired. Like we, we fill in the blanks, right? We tell ourselves a story, and we internalize it. We bring it all upon ourselves. They heard. They caught me. I'm in trouble. Or they're mad at me. This is going to be an awful day. Anybody ever done that before? Okay, we, we do this. All, I tell myself a story. I develop a feeling. Maybe it's fear, anxiety, uncertainty, whatever the feeling may be. And here's the action. Later, I've got to go to that coffee pot that I made, and I've got to walk past their office, and I'm not even going to make eye contact with them now. And now they see something, or they hear something. Wow, he sure is rude today. He didn't even acknowledge I'm here. The, this happens time and time again, hundreds of times a day. And for us to move from seeing and hearing something to action is zero to 60 in 2.5 seconds. Zip, and we're there. Maybe, maybe you were on the bleachers at the baseball game watching the children play, and you heard the conversation next to you. Fred, can I pick on you today? Thank you, Fred. Because I know this wouldn't be Fred, and I love to pick on Fred. And they're talking about Fred. And they're, the things they are saying about Fred is making my blood boil. Well, I've seen something and I've heard something, and I haven't had any conversation with Fred, but it's the next day, and I'm walking through Publix, and I'm on aisle three, and I look on the other end, and it's Fred. <laughs> and you know what I do? you know what, I don't think I need anything on aisle three. I'm going to go to aisle four. And I'm going to avoid Fred, and I'm not even talked to Fred. But I've just heard something about Fred that may or may not even be true, and now I've developed a feeling, I've developed an emotion, and now I'm acting negatively toward Fred. Poor Fred. <laughs> I'm sorry, brother. Maybe it's at home. Maybe i got to be real... <laughs> i to be real careful here. I'm going to speak very broadly and let you fill in the blanks. But maybe it's at home and, and you didn't do something right or you didn't put something away or you responded, you know, with, guys, we're bad about this. Like we give like one word answers instead of like stories, whatever. And then the reaction may be like, are you mad at me? Like, did I do something? No, you didn't, you didn't do anything. And we... You're smart enough to contextualize this into your life, to see how this happens over and over. Sometimes it is in very small things. Sometimes it is in very big things. Here's what you need to understand. God has called us in our homes, in our marriages, through our parenting, in the workplace, in the marketplace, at the ball field, and in the church. He has called us to cultivate peace. He's called us to cultivate peace. Peace and cultivation is a verb, and it requires us sometimes to turn that over, to flip that story over. Let's go back to the graphic if we can. For me to reprocess this and cultivate peace, it means I've got to go to Fred and say, Hey, Fred, this is what I saw and heard. Is that true? Okay, I need you to give me more information because I've got to retell myself a story to develop a different emotion and a different action. And you know what that requires us to do? In love and in grace and in the spirit of peace, sit down eye to eye and talk about it. The, the Word of God even illustrates this for us in Matthew chapter 18, verses 20, I mean 15 through 20. And it is this expectation, hey, if you've got something with a brother, here's, here's what the Scripture doesn't say. If you have something with your brother, post it on social media for the world to see. It doesn't say, if you have an issue with your brother, tell all of your friends about it and burn the cell phone towers down with information. It doesn't say that. If you have something with your brother, send a mass text and say, 
repeat and send this to other people. It doesn't say that. What does it tell us in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15? If you have an issue with your brother, you go to them in private, one-on-one, face-to-face, eye-to-eye, and you work it out. Why? Because we're called to cultivate peace. And 99.99999% of the time, when we hear and we cultivate the rest of the story, we begin to gain understanding. Let's go back to the situation, if we can, from the text. How does this play out here? The Jews from Ephesus say, and it says this in verses 27, 28, 29, we saw him with this Gentile. We saw him going to the temple, so they had to have gone together. I saw something. I told myself a story. I had a feeling, and now we react. Oh, everybody and everywhere. He is just upheavaling, turning over the world. This pagan has defiled the temple. And a mob ensues. Now, in the grand scheme and story, God uses this for Paul. We'll see in a couple of weeks because he has a mission for Paul. God even uses these circumstances. There's hope even if we find ourselves in those situations. But let's take the example. Let's go back to the example of your boss. What if you're sitting there working, you've made the coffee, he walks by, he or she, they slam the door, go in the office. What if rather than avoiding them, it, the, the response of care and peace would have been, hey, we didn't get a chance to speak today. Is everything okay? What if their relationship, that conversation, they begin to open up, but my wife and I got in an argument today, or I've got a friend who is sick and dying in the hospital, or whatever, they may unpack something personal, and you realize, oh, that's why you seem disconnected. It's not about me. It's because you've got something going on in your life that I can help you through. Now that I have a different story, the feeling and the action is very different because we're cultivating and working toward peace. Now, listen, I, I know my story and I know the normal patterns and tendencies of life. So I could assume that some of the examples I've given today, you've lived them out. But I know that this cycle happens in our life all the time, multiple times a day. And my prayer is that we would all recognize how God has called us to live, that He has called us to peace, that He has called us to unity, that He has called us to fight the real enemy, and it's not one another. Your husband is not your enemy. Your children are not your enemy. Your your boss or your employees or your teammates are not your enemy. We're called to love and show grace and peace and point them to Jesus by being the hands and feet of Jesus to them every day. So what do we do with this? Uh, My encouragement to you is that as we've been talking and unpacking this story today, that the Spirit of God has impressed something in your life where like, you know, I, I need to work on that or I need to do that differently or I've got to put that into practice. Whatever it is He's told you to do, my prayer is that you would have the courage to put it into action. I'm going to propose for you a few possible next steps. And if it's one of these, great. If it's not, you do whatever the Lord's telling you to do. So here's the first possible next step today. Maybe you're here today, you're hearing of this this call to live differently. And you say, wow, that's so counterintuitive to my life. And if that's what a life with Jesus looks like, I want to put my trust in Him. So maybe you're here today and it's your choice that you want to begin your journey with Jesus. And if that's the desire of your heart, please notice that. In the next step, one of our pastors would love to sit and talk with you about what that means and what a relationship with Jesus looks like and what putting your trust in Jesus looks like. Because we want you to walk in rhythm with Him. Maybe you're here today and you've got to have a change of view and you're going to commit to fight the real enemy and not your spouse or not your kids or not your employees or not your teammates or not your life group members, or whatever. I'm going to choose to fight the real enemy, and his name is Satan. And perhaps you're just going to put a stake in the ground today, and I'm going to claim peace in my relationships. And it may mean that I've got to have some awkward conversations. Cultivating peace is going to require us to revisit what we saw and heard to tell ourselves a different story 
or we can never find a pathway toward peace. And so that may be the claim that you have to make today. And it may mean you got to invite somebody to coffee later this week and really have a private, one-on-one, uncomfortable conversation. If the sake is peace, it's worth it. It's worth it. Whatever the Lord is telling you to do this week, whatever he's telling you to do in this moment, have the courage to do it. Would you pray with me? God, we love you. Lord, you are a good, good father, faithful to the end. We thank you that you have given us a spirit of peace so that the price of our sin debt has been paid. We've been made right with you. We have the hope of eternity because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And now we have been challenged to show that peace toward others, to exercise that love toward others, to be the voice and beacon of hope in our homes, our community, and to the world. Give us the courage to take the next step that you've called us to do today. In Jesus' name, amen.